Fee, fa, fo, fum. I might be huge, but I'm not dumb. Welcome everyone to another book review. Today I have for you David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell with the subtitle Underdogs, Misfits and the Art of Battling Giants. This book, why did I read it? Well, I came across it randomly in the library. It wasn't part of my set reading list, but I have enjoyed some of his previous works such as The Tipping Point, Outliers and Blink. And so I said, hell yeah, why not? I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot. So this book was published in 2013 and it's a collection of nine core stories which each have some sort of associated branching up of small stories. So it's a lot of stories from history and also from modern times of all sorts of people. And it's, I guess it's trying to show you, showing how an underdog can beat the system or how underdogs have beat the system. There's three parts. And so I'll read them for you now. The first is the advantages of disadvantages and the disadvantages of advantages. So that's where he's talking about how what might be perceived as a, a bad thing could actually be the, the seed of something greater and the same uh, vice versa. Maybe someone you think is in a very powerful position, but that could actually be to their detriment. The second one is the theory of desirable difficulty. So this is where he's talking about how the bad things that you might have had earlier in your life can actually shape you to, to have what is now considered a superpower or by having that, it allowed you to create different systems that were then would uh, then allow you to succeed elsewhere. The third one is the limits of power. So, and this is where he's talking about how, while you might think someone is super powerful, while you might think a system or everyone can just do what they want, if you've got power, you can just click your fingers and it gets done. No, and it's sort of like money in that sense. You think your money can do all these things, but it actually can do a very a subset of small things. And then the most important stuff like your relationships in life, your health, a lot of that's not dictated by money, but what you actually do and, and how you live in the world. So it talks about all sorts of things. It's got all sorts of stories. It'll go from you know stories of kids' basketball teams to how uh, people should be learning, uh, how kids should learn in different environments to... Uh, a couple of stories of, of parents and how their, their children got murdered, of the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King, of just, it just goes, bounces back and forth here and there everywhere. So uh, like I was mentioning, there are a lot of stories in this book, so be prepared for that. Some of the themes of the book. Number one, I would say preconceptions. So what's a preconception? It's an idea or opinion formed without enough information to give the correct or to give the right uh, opinion or yeah essentially that so funnily enough i would say most of the time our preconceptions are actually really good they 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 do a decent job uh, and that is what i guess you would call common sense and common sense i think we all agree is you know it's, you need to have that in to be able to just get by in life uh, what he does talk about in the book though is i guess when you're breaking the mold of coming from an underdog position, you do need to have some sort of ingenuity. It's not just, you know, you're the underdog with the, the weaker position. And if you do these simple steps or if you follow this pattern, you'll be able to be successful. No, 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 no. It's, it's more, you need to be very ingenious. You need to be very creative. And you also need to be prepared that it will ruffle some feathers. So most of the people I would say in this book were not treated super kindly or were not encouraged because what they were doing was outside of the norms and required a different way of thinking or a different level of responsibility of acting in the world. It did get me thinking though, you know, with preconceptions, so it was formed without enough information. So then there's a question of, okay, when is it your responsibility to actually gather enough data? He's got a couple of instances in the book, particularly of the three strike law in, in um, California, which was a, essentially a law saying, if you're a criminal and you have two strike, uh, you, if you have multiple strikes, the severity of your punishments goes up and up. And it got to this weird point where a guy could have, uh, have committed a, a robbery a couple of years earlier, then committed armed ass assault or something. And then his third crime could be stealing a pizza um, for example, and he gets locked in jail for 25 years to life. That This is one of those ones where he was saying, okay, while you might think you're doing good, it is also necessarily, and this is, I've talked about this on and on and on, 
having good intentions is not enough and you need to make sure those intentions are leading to good outcomes. And so then it's, I guess, when is the responsibility to gather enough data to make sure that you're having the good outcomes? Because you can't apply that to everything because then you would say, oh, if you're walking down the street, is actually that actually the right thing to do in life? Well, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I, I guess for me, what I would take from that is maybe if you want to implement a change that will affect other people's lives, this is where you probably need to really knuckle down on the data, really be sure that, hey, this is actually having a positive impact and that it's not having the, you know, a neutral impact or even worse, a detrimental impact in causing more crime, which is sort of what was coming out from the, the studies done on the, the three strikes law. Another one, the main thing, I guess, of the book is underdogs. So got me thinking, is it ever better to be the overdog? Are there people out there who they are the overdog and that is actually the better position to be in? And this is more related to mindset. So if you're thinking of someone, and I'm going to use in this context probably sports analogies because they're the easiest. When you think of a team or a person, let's say Novak Djokovic versus a unseeded person in the first round of the Australian Open. Okay, what what is the winner's mindset there? What is what is the best way of actually getting through this? And I would actually argue that what we could consider, what might be the pre preconception of a a winner's mindset of being of thinking you're the best, having this unlimited confidence, not being humble, just being, you know, rocking up there and just saying like i'm the best i'm you know I'm, I'm using that using all your your past victories as a sort of guiding stone a, a block for you to stand upon to then beat another person I, I would sort of argue that okay maybe that's that's probably not the best way maybe a, the true great winners maybe they always require a touch of disadvantage in their own mind even if it's a trick to or to, to be able to then have the almost underdog mentality, which which seems to be what can allow people to, to win. Uh, yeah, it just got me thinking that, okay, maybe, and there are plenty of examples of, you know, super rich, super famous people who are arrogant, who have no humbleness, but is that actually how they think when they're coming into the fight? Or do they sort of think something like, everyone expects me to win, I've got so much pressure on me, man, this pressure is a real disadvantage. I'm going to use this disadvantage to, to overcome. I actually am the underdog due to all the pressure on me in this situation. If I ever got to a position like that, that's probably how I would sort of see it or maybe even have a touch of nothing to lose as well saying, you know, I am, I am in this position, but if I lose, who cares? Because I've got millions of dollars to fall back down upon and I've got my whole legacy. It doesn't matter if I lose this one game or whatever. So... I think that's that's a, an important question to ask. And then probably even more important is, is it even worth thinking about underdogs? And this gets into a, a thing that I've been thinking about, which is um, the infinite game, the infinite game and competition. When is it useful? When is it not? And I think there's a lot of, uh, and I'm reading a book by Simon Sinek at the moment called, I think it's called um, Finite and Infinite Games or The Infinite Game. And it's, it's interesting in the sense that you don't have to play these games. You don't have to be in competition always. You can choose to play a game where it's infinite and you just have to keep going and going and you can never win at it. And that's sort of the point of it. That's you just keep going. And I, I would sort of argue if you're, if you're really getting stuck into the underdog or the overdog or <laughs> overdog's no term, I guess you call it the favorite um, mentality maybe it's even worth asking, you know, should I even be playing this game? And I, I find that a, a useful tip and trick as well to use in my own life. If I'm doing the podcasting, is it actually a competition? You can think of it as a competition if you want, or you could reframe it in your own mind so that it's just an infinite game. This is just part of my life. This is just something I'm doing. I'm never actually going to succeed at it. I can get better at it, but there's no end point. There's no winning or losing. I get to a billion downloads and then I'm happy? No, like who cares? There's there's more after that as well. So my own personal observations, I would say the middle section of this book is a little bit shaky and is probably the weakest. Uh, and this is the section where he's arguing having all these bad things in your life can actually contribute to becoming better. So he's got a couple of uh, stories from this. So 
did the dyslexia did dyslexia actually help out David Bowie's and there was another couple of people in there? Is that what actually helped them to become these super great lawyers? He he's sort of arguing in the book. Yes, he also has another example of uh, a doctor called Emil Freireich, um, who was basically the inventor of the chemotherapy as we sort of know it today for leukemia, which is uh, repeated doses of mixing high, like highly toxic drugs together, continually applied even when it seems that the the cancer has gone away but continually doing it to, to make sure that the cancer actually is, is fully um, defeated in a sense. And as he paints the picture in this book, this guy comes across as a complete tool, a complete asshole. He seems like an angry, you know, desperate person who has no care for anyone else, even though he's working to, to help these kids' lives. It doesn't really seem like he actually cares about them. He treats his colleagues like shit and he's got all, the, all these things and... Malcolm Gladwell's sort of arguing, yes, yes, this is, you know, the his really rough childhood which he had contributed. This is what made him the this these um, collection of af- attributes, such as being very dominant, such as being very um, anti-establishment, such as being very um, uh, like aggressive and pushing back on things, um, non-cooperative. This is actually what formed him into this human being who was able to then defy the system and then create the, the, this cure, which is un, un, undeniably is a good thing. But is that actually the case? Is that actually what made, is that what made him? And I, I would sort of argue, and I've heard this being argued by uh, Simon Sinek again, who I mentioned just before, which was, you know, was uh, Bill Gates such a, uh, not sorry, not Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. Was Steve Jobs in charge of Apple and was he such a success because of his domineering, uh, overbearing personality where he would chew people out and, and yell at them. Um, he sort of takes a stance that, no, he was a success despite being all these things. And that's what I would sort of argue as well. I would, I would say, yes, maybe the, the rough childhood did contribute to some of these things, but maybe it contributed just to the anger portion of it. And he still would have had that non-cooperative personality because maybe that's just what was baked into his genes and he succeeded despite having such a shit childhood i i'm I'm personally on more of the side that you, you succeed despite having these things and that having these real bad things in your life doesn't actually isn't isn't exactly what it is that makes you the best and there's a there's a tough one i'm i'm not 100 percent sure of this i've heard Plenty of other things. If you listen to Joe Rogan, for example, he talks all the time about how com- the best comedians are the ones who had the really fucked up childhoods. If you listen to, yeah, all, all sorts of people say, yeah, the reason I got, you know, cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me because it then allowed me to see all these, uh, you know, different aspects of my life and whatnot. I think I could make a pretty good argument about why, on the whole, that's not true, but who, who knows? Who knows? So, my observations. Uh, uh, after that as well is, I guess, looking beneath the surface approach is good, but it can still be shallow. And that's what I would say happened in this book. Even though it's 300 pages long, roughly, it, it still felt shallow because there was so many stories in it and he didn't really dive deep enough. Uh, and it, it, did, it, yeah, it just didn't hit home to what I thought this book could have been um, in, in, in comparison to what it actually is. So my summary of the book, it's uh, engaging if you have yet to read his style of presenting things and having so many simultaneous collections of stories all fitting together and then connecting each other in a big circle sort of thing. Uh, But for me, it really lacked a real direction. Um, He points out, for example, mistakes that some people made, but there was no real connection to the underdog story in it. There was a couple of people where, you know, one lady went to a high class um, for those university, the the best university in the world, sort of Yale, Brown level type, the, the top class. Whereas if she'd gone to another one that was less lesser and she could have been a, a big fish in a small pond, this could have worked out. Didn't really have any, any connection to the underdog stories. And there was a couple of like that where it just made me go, okay, this doesn't really apply to what I thought the book would be about. 
So I wasn't bored, but I wouldn't call this book mind blowing. Um, and I got through it pretty quick, but I'm probably not gonna, really going to remember this book in you know five years, ten years time. So overall, I'm giving David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell a five out of ten. It's okay. It's okay. I would say it's. I'd recommend it to people who like lots of different stories, who like a shallow look at something, but then get distracted easily and want to jump onto a a similar but unconnected topic. This is the book for you. What's my pragmatic takeaway? Well, it's actually to stay clear of these types of books, of the the multiple story books. I think I'm probably getting more to the stage where I enjoy a thicker, denser book that maybe I can read only six of them in a year compared to 15 of these types of books, but I'd probably get more knowledge from those six books because it really dived deep on a topic and, and went deep into it. So um, sorry, Mr. Gladwell, but I, I think I'll be skipping your books for at least um, the, the immediate future. That's it for the moment. What do you think of Malcolm Gladwell's books? Do you enjoy them? Have you read any before? If you, was my review heavy handed? Was I a bit unfair? I think I was okay, but who knows? <laughs> I, I could be in the, the David position and I'm waiting for a, um, uh, sorry, in the Gol Goliath position, I'm waiting for a, a David YouTube or uh, podcast comment to knock me down from my pedestal. That would be excellent. That's it for today. Kyron out. Ooh.